millions of people are already striving for peace, for equality, for the animals, for the environment, for the trees, for mangroves, for the sea, for the earth. Millions of earthlings are pacifists, already waking, singing, reducing suffering, acting consciously, positively reconnecting themselves with nature. For universal responsibility, realizing and recognizing that all turn into one, into one nation Earth. For we only have one Earth, even though we are consuming the resources equivalent to four Earths every day. So now we must ask ourselves, why do we fight? Hey buddy, um, it is awesome to be with you here today. My name is Peter, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, and I just wanted to reiterate what Steve, our host, said. If this is your first time, welcome. If this is your first time in a long time, welcome back. We're really, really happy to have you here. Really excited. Uh, this is our second part in a four-part series called When Science and God Collide. Uh, last week, Kurt kicked us off. He talked about uh, space in the expanding universe, talked about creation, the origin of creation, and really debunked, dispelled that myth that science and God are, are mutually exclusive. They're really not. They're, they're integrated. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the environment. And not just the environment, but people's role in the environment. And not just people's role in the environment, but specifically Christians' role in the environment. So when you think about the environment, it's probably like one of the most polarizing issues that we can think of. Uh, it's what we call a hot topic. I mean, people are really passionate about this word environment. You know, it, I've been in rooms with people where, where they're debating, people are passionate, and really politicians, especially in DC area, they use this topic to pull on people's heartstrings because people are so passionate about this, regardless of which end of the spectrum you're on. But kind of going through, I realize that there's a lot more common ground when we talk about the environment, um, especially for us and, and our church and our community, than uh, we really realize. Uh, so, you know, it, it's polarizing, it's on headlines, people talk about it, people argue about it, but I just wanted to make sure for myself. I wanted to kind of reach the people look at the people and see, well, is it really polarizing? Do people really think this topic is something that needs to be discussed and argued about? So naturally, I went to Twitter. Twitter's probably the best thing. You go to Twitter and you find a lot of like uh, insight. This is what the cool people do, right? It's what they, what they say in Twitter and you kind of understand what, what people are talking about here. So this graph, it's just a simple graph. It's called a, a sentiment analysis. So what you do is you just looked at the, the f last 500 words that, that are tweets that had the word environment. So the, the last 500 tweets that had the word environment as the subject, uh, what it does, it'll, it'll look at the tweet and then it will, it, what we call, put in polarizing categories or polarity categories. It'll say, if the majority of words in this tweet are positive, you know, after it, it strips off the, the hashtags and the Twitter handles and, and articles, just unnecessary words. So the majority of the words are uh, positive, this tweet gets a positive designation. If the majority of words about the environment are negative, the tweet gets a negative designation. Um, and you can just see from the graph, uh, the red is negative, the green is, is, is positive, and then the blue is, is neutral. But just to walk through an example, I picked a random tweet. Uh, for just purposes of an example, I, I use the keyword Olympic. Just pick a random tweet. Um, just some random lady named Katie who's clearly obsessed with a guy named Peter uh, says, he's so handsome, he reminds me of an Olympic athlete. Random tweet I picked, uh, but as you can see, this would get a positive. It'd be a, it would be a plus one in the positive category. So going back, this really kind of confirms just how polarizing of a topic the environment are. People, people like really want to fight about this. They want to argue about it. People are passionate about it. And if you, if you take it to the next level, you see kind of the range of emotions. You can dissect it. I don't want to put more graphs, but you'll see people are disgusted. People are angry. People are upset. People are saddened. People are hurt. They're afraid. They're surprised about the word environment. People are, are joyful. People are perfectly content. And those are kind of the topics that are going on. 
with environment. So uh, just to show of hands, how many people here like polluting? Is that, I see someone kind of raising. Does anyone like littering? Like anyone here like to litter? Does anyone wake up and say, my goal is to get as much oil in the ocean as possible? Like does anyone say that? Or does anyone say, I'm going to cut down as many trees as I can? My life goal is to just cut down the trees. No one says that. Or like you go on, on a family vacation and you don't go you know, to, to your wife and you say, honey, let's wake up really early today and watch that beautiful smog over the sunrise. Like just smell that smog and let's get our eyes really watering today. Nobody says that. But then why is the environment such a hot topic? Like why do people talk about the environment in, in such a, a negative or a positive light. I feel like there's a lot of common ground. So it boils down to, there's this idea, it's called the greenhouse gas effect. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this. Basically, just looking at a greenhouse, for example, has anyone been to a greenhouse? Anyone? What's like the common theme of greenhouse? It's, it's, exa it's just, it's unbearably hot. It's just, it's suffocating. I personally don't like being in a greenhouse because it's so high, I start sweat, sweating, it's just, it's a lot. It's unbearable. But what happens is you got these, the, the sunlight, which is solar radiation, but we'll just call it sunlight. It goes through the glass and then the Earth's surface absorbs it. The Earth's surface absorbs the heat and then, and then releases it as heat energy. But they're greenhouse gases and, and what happens specifically in the greenhouse is the heat as it rises, uh, heat rises because hot air expands, it becomes less dense. So like just a log floating on water, it's the same principle. So it rises, but the, the glass itself traps in the heat. So that's why it's so hot. And it's the same way with, with the Earth. We got the sun and the solar radiation, it's penetrating the ozone layer, going through the atmosphere, it's touching the surface of the Earth, and then heat energy is trapped by greenhouse gases. And that's carbon dioxide, that's methane, some nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, makes people laugh. Um, you got water vapor, uh, water and humidity. Water has what they call a high specific heat, so it actually absorbs a lot of energy. Uh, and that's why places that have a lot of water feel like that humidity, because really water vapor in the atmosphere and, and, and your environment is absorbing a lot of heat. Um, and this is a good thing. This is a really good thing. If there were no greenhouse gases in the Earth, the average temperature would be zero 0.4 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about negative 18 degrees Celsius. So we need greenhouse gases. This is a very good thing to keep the average temperature of our, our, our Earth relatively warm. So what's the issue? Again, like what's the fuss? This thing called global warming, right? People have this, this issue with global warming. I'm not going to talk about global warming right now. We'll, we'll get into it. But um, like one of the underlying issues is that humans are consuming a lot more than they're contributing. And even more so, humans are consuming in a way where the earth and the resources can't really replenish at the rate we're consuming. Um, we live in a very, very consumeristic society. Now, I don't need to tell you that. Um, we try to accumulate as many things as possible, as much stuff in our house. Our houses are getting bigger. and We're putting a lot of junk in there. And this is good for the economy, right? If you look at GDP, you know, one function of GDP is consumer spending. Last year, our US GDP was about $18 trillion. Eleven and a half trillion of that equation was just on consumer spending. So 65%. It's, it's huge. Um, and I think society tells us to divine, define ourselves by our possessions. That really the earth exists to give us a pleasant experience. And there's a, C.S. Lewis wrote this book called The Screwtape Letters. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's basically chronicling dialogue between uh, demons. There's like a head demon, and he's basically instructing and training kind of the junior level subordinate demon on how to attack humans and how to conduct spiritual warfare. So like write letters back, and it's like this guy's like, no, 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 this is what you need to try in the humans. This is the best way to to cause spiritual warfare, and this is kind of how you attack humans living on the earth, because we want, we want to win them over. So C.S. Lewis wrote a book, and, and this is an excerpt. It's called Screwtape Letters, but he's writing about um, how an older demon is training a younger demon, and he says, the sense of ownership in general is always to be encouraged. This is the older demon talking to the younger demon, 
about how to attack a human. He said, ownership is, in general, always to be encouraged. Humans are always putting up claims to ownership, which sound equally funny in heaven and in hell, and we must keep them doing so. You guys see what this is saying? He's saying ownership is laughable. God owns everything. God owns our lives. He owns our possessions. He owns everything that we have. And he's saying, let's try to get humans to think that ownership is the best. And we're even laughing. We're laughing about how, this is like the joke around the office. He goes on to say, and all the time the joke is, like, it's like if they're at the water cooler, I don't know how you use water, uh, like coffee, something sweltering hot, I don't know, whatever. Uh, no water, coffee. So, so he says, all the time the joke is that the word mine and its fully possessive sense cannot be uttered by a human about anything. The word mine and its possessive sense cannot be uttered by a human about anything. So how does this translate into the environment? Economists say consumption is very good. But you look at if the earth exists to give me a pleasant experience, kind of environment and the resources are collateral damage. The, it's, it's we are abusing what we have because we think we own everything. We think that the earth is ours. We think that the environment and the resources are ours. And we kind of forget that it's really God's. You know, you have deforestation. Deforestation, you're, you're cutting down a lot of trees. And we know, like, this is basic, honestly, photosynthesis is the biggest word you guys are going to hear me say. That's the biggest word. Trees, plants, they take carbon dioxide. And what do they do? They convert it to oxygen. So we're cutting down a lot more trees than trees are growing. Oil, I mean, aside from like the infamous BP Gulf Coast spill, I mean, oil, in essence, people are at a race to get as much oil and extract it from the earth as possible because they want to convert it to gasoline, because they want to sell it, because we drive a lot, we consume a lot for, for just operations purposes and, and, and operating motor vehicles. And, and, and this is something that is, is, is pretty, like, it's not bad, but we just need to be a little bit more aware. Um, landfills, we accumulate so much wealth, so much wealth. We accumulate so many possessions, and we spend so much. Where the landfills, like, you can see the stat. It says in the United States alone, we represent only 5%, 5% of the world's population. 30%, though. We also represent 30% of the, of the world's resources in terms of how much we're consuming, and we're producing 30% of the world's trash. That's a crazy stat for 5% of the population. How much we're consuming and contributing to the trash. And, and trash, when you burn trash, releases a lot of carbon emissions. And that's kind of like the issue. But people don't argue that. Like if you take a step back, people don't even argue. Like the facts are there, the numbers are there. Consumption is high. You can see it in the way we calculate GDP. You can see this stat. We're consuming a lot of things. People generally don't even argue our consumeristic society. So what do people argue about? It's a giant elephant in the room. It's called global warming. People really get heated about global warming. Um, and the idea is, so human activity, human consumption is the reason why there's an average increase in the Earth's temperature. That we are like the statistically significant reason our, our, our consumption um, and, and, and what we do with the environment and, and all the resources that we ultimately use that, that translate to carbon emissions, that we are the cause of the increase in the Earth's temperature. And people get really riled up because some people will say, you know what? Eventually, Earth's going to get so hot, polar ice caps are going to melt, we're going to be living underwater. D.C. is going to be underwater. I don't know, Manhattan's going to be underwater. San Francisco will be underwater. So all these places will be underwater, and eventually it'll all burn up. You say, we need to do something about it. And there are people that say, you know, this is, it's a hoax. It's not real. Like, you can't prove to me that we're increasing the Earth's temperature. So this is a loaded question. Um, so to prepare for this question, I enlisted the, uh, the help of a few folks um, to help answer this question of, is global warming really real? It, or is it just a hoax?
Hi, I'm Ali Bryce and we're here at the marvellous uh, Hackney Warehouse uh, with a special interview in how not to answer a question. Now, I'm joined by professional person Bob Fletcher. Thank you. Um, how are you? Very well. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, but we'll just kick things off uh, with a simple question first. Taking offence. Bob Fletcher, is that your name? I, I do take offence to the, the lining of that question of why you phrase that, because it suggests that my name is, is the only important thing I, about me, and I think people should consider the whole picture. It's cer- and certainly not the only important thing about you. Um, it's just perhaps the least important thing about you, um, which is why I've asked it so early on. Ran out of time! Is your name Bob Fletcher? OK, so what I'd like to do is just... I mean, I'll, I'll answer that question in a moment if you let me finish. Yep. You can let me finish? Good. Now, I was in Basingstoke recently. Okay. And um, whilst I was there, sure, lots of things happened to me. Things so, happened to everyone. So the viewers at home are, must be dumbfounded that a yeah. man like you cannot confirm that his name is Bob Fletcher. Now, I appreciate what you're... Tr- is your name Bob Fletcher? I have been given many is names... Is your name Bob Fletcher? The amount of names I've had... What's your name, son? Technical problems. Let me ask that question very early, and I, what I need to do is, or I want to try about belief system, and without too much, I think it's important to remember that uh, 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 for Bob Fletcher there. Thank you. Good. So you all thought that I was actually going to answer that question? I wasn't touching that question with a 10-foot pole. There was no way I was going to answer the question if global warming is real or not. Because that's not the point of the talk. I'm not here to tell you global warming is, uh, is real. It's happening. I'm not here to tell you global warming is, is a hoax. But I'm here to give you some fun and completely conflicting facts about global warming. So over the 20th century, global temperatures rose 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. During the last ice age, when ice was covering most of Europe, um, the average global temperature was only 9 degrees Fahrenheit colder than today. In 2013, there was a review of 11,000 peer-reviewed studies, published from 91 to 2011. found that 97% of climate researchers endorsed the idea that humans are causing global warming. 2010, a review of about 12,000 peer-reviewed studies found that 66.4% of the studies had no stated position on human-caused global warming. 32.6% of the studies implied or stated maybe or contribute to it, but we're not sure. Only 65 papers out of the 12,000, about half percent, explicitly stated that humans are the primary cause of global warming. Another peer-reviewed study found that global warming over the past 100 years has proceeded at a rate faster than any time in the past 11,000 years. 2010, another study of the Earth's climate said that about 450 million years ago, there was an intense period of glaciation, cooling, not warming, when CO2 levels were five times higher than they are today. So you guys tell me, they're completely contradictory. And that's why I'm not here to tell you, because I can't definitively say. But that's not the point of this talk. Because regardless of what you think about global warming and the resources and how much we're consuming, regardless of what you think about the effect, the process in our mindset is the same. That I honestly, I don't care about global warming, but how we treat the environment, regardless of how you feel and how you believe, is exactly the same. It doesn't matter. We should treat the environment the same, regardless, because environment is God's creation. Our role as Christians is we're not supposed to slap a bunch of facts in people's faces and say there's a potential apocalypse, there is an ensuing nightmare, a catastrophe, you're wrong, you got to get on the right side. Our goal as Christians is to love God and love the creation that God gave us. And that's humans as well, first and foremost, and then also be stewards of the creation that God appointed us and that he entrusted us with. So the real question we're going to answer, should we, should we be concerned as Christians about the environment? And the answer is yes. It's a resounding yes. God entrusted us as stewards about the environment and with his creation. Now, what does a steward mean? Father Anthony talked about this last week in his sermon. A steward is basically someone that's entrusted over another man's possessions. Someone that is concerned with another person's affairs, and they've been assigned with basically overseeing and managing somebody's affairs 
somebody's possessions. And really in ancient times, in ancient kingdoms, the steward was really like the right hand. This was a person that was trusted more than anybody because they knew that they were accountable and that they could get the job done. And we see many, many examples of stewardship. Um, so many in the Bible, what came to mind was Joseph in the Old Testament. He oversaw all the land of Egypt. He was entrusted by Pharaoh. He was the right hand of Pharaoh. And, and basically, Pharaoh gave him like rulership in essence. He said, you can go ahead and, and oversee this because I trust you. You were able to interpret dreams. Like you prepared us for a famine. Like this, I trust you more than anyone. You're my steward. And then Eliezer. Eliezer this is an underrated character. Um, this guy was like, a, I want to say like a, a high servant, like a servant above all servants for Abraham. He oversaw Abraham's wealth, his livestock. He oversaw his other servants. And even if you guys want to know like where the definition of a wingman came from, like it came from Eliezer. That's where this, this concept, I mean, this guy was, was entrusted by Abraham so much. The guy traveled hundreds of miles to find a wife for Isaac. And not just any wife, like a very spiritual wife, a good wife named Rebecca. So all you single guys out there, you guys make sure you find your Eliezer, get your wingman, because <laughs> that those are the kind of friends that you need. Someone that's willing to travel a couple hundred miles to find you a perfect wife. Um, so the first example of stewardship, though, we talked about a couple. The first example is us. It's, it's us. And you see that in Genesis 2.15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. That's the first example of stewardship in the Bible. It was all us. It was with man. Say, keep it. And just so you, you guys know, like the English translation, it doesn't really fully capture a lot of times what the real meaning is. So if you look at the word work, it, in Hebrew, it means abad. And that actually means like service. So, so God is saying the Lord God took man and put him in the garden to serve it. Abba, to serve it. And then when you see keep it, that's the Hebrew word is, is, is shamar, which means like to preserve, to exercise care, to guard. So, so God is saying you're, you're serving the creation. Like you are in charge of this. We're putting you in the garden, man, to, to, to preserve, to guard to exercise care over, to serve. And, and, and that, a lot of that is, is lost when we translate it. Um, and just so you know, caring for God's creation is actually a priestly duty. It's a priestly duty. These same words, Abad and Shamar, are used in the Bible when God is speaking to the tribe of Levi, when God is speaking to priests. He uses the exact same words. Um, in Numbers 3, uh, God directs the tribe of Levi. He says, the Lord said to Moses, bring the tribe of Levi and present them to Aaron, the priest, to assist them. They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of the meeting, which is like the tabernacle, by doing the work, abad, by doing, it's the same word as we see in Genesis 2.15, by doing the abad, the work of the tabernacle. They are to take care, shamar, same word, of all the furnishings of the tent of the meeting fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work, again, Abad, of the tabernacle. This is for the priests. Again, in Numbers 18, but only you and your sons may serve, Abad, as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I am giving you the service, Shamar, same word, of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary is to be put to death. You see kind of the, the relationship of, of man in the garden? It's not just to take care and use resources. It's really to serve in the way the priest served. And, and so in the Old Testament, just a tidbit, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. So the role of the priest in the Old Testament was a couple things. The main role function of a priest was to guard the sanctity of the sacred space. Anyone say that four times quickly? The sanctity of the sacred space. That was a primary role, the sanctuary. And then they also ha conducted uh, ceremonial worship, right? They led the people in ceremonial worship. Um, and the high priest offered sacrifices. They actually weren't even responsible for preaching or teaching. And nothing to do with that. It was actually like, if you look at it, it'll be like the deacons, the congregation. They were part of instructing. The priests were the ones that protected, that guarded. 
And you see here, caring for God's creation, those same words are used. It's a priestly duty, caring for the environment in God's creation. But Peter, come on. It says we're supposed to subdue and rule, right? Like if you see this, it says be, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So, I mean, yeah, I understand, but it says subdue and rule. So subdue, again, going to the Hebrew word, subdue actually means uh, kabosh. And it, it, it is subduing, but it's like, uh, it's when the party that is supposed to be subdued is, is harsh or hostile. And if you guys kind of follow this imagery with me, like imagine you're like a king and you're in a castle and all of a sudden, you know, the people who are at the top of the tower and they're looking down and they see like a whole bunch of people on, on horses and with bow and arrows and, and fire and they're just ready to overtake your castle, right? You see these people that are coming for you. And you know, the people on the tower, they go tell the king, they're like, look, we're being under attack, we're being, we're being sieged. And the king says, well, we had a nice run. It's great while it lasted. No, you don't do that. Like you soften the blow of your enemy. Like someone is coming in, they're hostile, you soften the blow. And basically this is saying, Subdue, kabosh, is saying soften the blow because creation will not do a man's bidding. Like, like a turkey doesn't ring your doorbell and say, you know, last year you baked my cousin. Can, this year, can you fry me for Thanksgiving? Like people had to hunt. People have to make clothes. People use leather from animals to warm themselves up. Nature is harsh and men have to subdue it. People have to subdue it because creation will not do a man's bidding. Rule. Hebrew word is rada. So rada means like the rule in a dominating, like uh, uh, if you think of it like a royal dominance, right? Like a, a royal rulership. Rada is, is, is the type of ruler of a king and it's, it's the dominating rule of a king. And I kind of want to pause because there's, there's different examples of, of rulership. God is the perfect example of a ruler because he's the ultimate ruler. Um, and that same word is used in Psalm 72, which is Rada. And, and it talks about God and his characteristics and how God likes to rule. And I think we need to follow that example. So it says, he shall have dominion or Rada. It's the same word, also from sea to sea. And from the river to the ends of the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. And his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all the kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy. He will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and precious shall be their blood in his sight. You see what kind of ruler God is? So the same word about dominating? Yeah, definitely. His enemies are going to lick his dust. Definitely. But you see what kind of caring ruler God is? It's the same word where it says rule here. That's the kind of ruler God wants. Kind of, if you want to see the contrast, what ruler God doesn't want, Ezekiel 34, basically in a tirade against Israel's kings and the priests and the magistrates, he's upset with the rulership. And he says through Ezekiel, because he wants Ezekiel to tell the people, says the weak you have not strengthened. These are to the rulers of Israel. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. With force and cruelty you have ruled them. You see the differentiation between the type of rulership God wants and the type of rulership he doesn't want? There's a clear contrast. So there's this pivotal turning point. If you guys look at, at, at Scripture, every time the word God is mentioned, when God is mentioned, the word Lord preceded it. So you have creation, and it's always the Lord God made. The Lord God planted man in the garden. The Lord God said it is not good for man to be alone. Always the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. And if you look at Lord, it means, it means ruler, Yahweh. It means like, like absolute ruler. It's only until Satan came during the fall and he said, for the first time, you know, this is, he, he, he's, Satan is introducing God and he, and he removes the word Lord 
from his title. So you have all of, all of creation and you have the fall. And Lord, 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 you are my ruler, you are my king, you are the creator of creation. Ruler. And then all of a sudden Satan comes in and the first time God is introduced without the word Lord is when Satan comes in and says, has God, not the Lord God, indeed said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. I don't think it's a coincidence that the fall and separation happen when we basically listen to Satan, we accepted it, and we realized that God is not, is not a ruler. We came to, to the, the, this term of accepting what Satan had to say, and you know, we dismiss God as the ruler of our life. I don't think there's a coincidence. You know, people say separation didn't happen um, overnight. Like it wasn't just someone ate from an apple. It wasn't like someone just ate fruit and then all of a sudden they were separated from God. It was a process. And then that process is man forgetting who the ruler was. Is man saying, I don't, I don't care about the creation. I just care about, or I'm sorry, I don't care about the creator. I just care about creation. You guys can fill in the, the underline. It says, we forgot about the creator, ruler, and we focused on the creation. And then there's, you know, creation eagerly waits. So there was this famous theologian. His name was Karl Barth. He was a Protestant theologian, and he said something that holds really true. He said, there's no such thing as the study of, of, of anthropology, said, or, or man. There's no such thing as anthropology. It doesn't exist. Anthropology is something that just, it doesn't exist. The study of humans and, 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 and man and humanity. He said, really, because you can't understand man without God. That, that man is only understood in relation to God. And man only exists in relation to God. So anthropology, to me, to, to, to Karl Barth, he's saying that's not even a word in my dictionary. He said it's really theanthropology. Theo means God because he said humans will never be understood apart from God. It's always theanthropology because we will never understand humans fully. We can't understand the creation unless we understand the creator. So you can never separate the two. And it's the same with ecology. It's the same with physiology, with cosmology, biology. Like creation knows you can never understand creation without understanding who our creator is. And you see this verse in Romans. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. It says creation is waiting for the revealing of, of who? The sons of God. Does it, does it say son with a capital S talking about Christ? No. It says sons, lowercase s, sons of God. That creation is in anticipation. All of creation is waiting for that distorted image of man to be restored. For the distorted image from the fall to be restored. And creation is waiting for that. They're waiting to see the glory of the children of God. And they're waiting for the time where God entrusted man as stewards and appointed man as stewards over the creation and over the environment. And they are waiting in anticipation because they're saying, you know what, you guys, you screwed this up for us. You fell and now I'm suffering because no longer did you remember that God is the creator. You separated it. You dismissed the title Lord. Now you guys consume, you consume, you consume, you consume, and you forget. And the creation is saying, you guys, you just screwed it up for all of us. I can't wait to see the revealing of the sons of God. I can't wait to see the children of God restored. I can't wait to see that image restored. It says till now they're waiting. Um, our environment is made to glorify God. There are a couple of verses. It says, all the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. That's in Psalm 19. It says, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. It's in Revelation. And then some of the Pharisees we know in, in this verse, it's talking about how uh, you know, it was, it was during Palm Sunday and the entry and they're saying, blessed be, 
um, the Lord, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the Pharisees are saying, hey, stop, like, don't say that. And Jesus is saying, look, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. The stones themselves would worship God because all of God's creation is made to worship God. Like God created man. He created Adam from the earth. God always said that the earth was good. Like everything creates. And the Lord saw that it was good. So is, is God going to, is, is he going to look at one creation that he made that said this is good and then create man from something that isn't good, who is also good? No. Like man is good and he's going to create it from something that he created that was good. So for us to say the environment and, the, and, the, and our resources and, and, and they just exist to give me some, some great experience I should consume as much as possible is wrong. God's saying that everything was made to glorify God because God loves all of his creation. Now humans are the prize and joy. Humans are like the prize possession. Humans are the apple of God's eye. But he loves his creation because he created it. And it says, bring all who claim me as their God for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. And a lot of times when we look at our environment and we look at our surroundings, there's a lot of times, you know, we see, especially when we travel, right? We go to places and we see beautiful things and beautiful scenery. We say, man, God's amazing. Like, how did he create that? Such an artist. And you worship God through his creation because you look at it and you say, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Like only someone like God, like God or, or a creator, a ruler is only capable of creating such beauty. And we, we look at that and we, we, it, it helps us worship, knowing that God created such beautiful things and, and, and for his glory. So what's my role as a steward? Honor creation. Like I'm, I, I don't want to be controversial here. My goal is not to be controversial. I, I told you about global warming and, and you guys are all very smart people. You guys have you know, your own opinions. The goal is not to persuade you one way or the other because honestly, it, it doesn't matter. What does matter is caring for God's creation. What does matter is caring for the environment. And I'm not telling you don't hunt. People hunt all the time, but like people hunt for food. I'm not even saying that. I'm not even saying if you have a, you know, a, a mouse or a rat in your apartment not to get rid of it. Like I'm not saying that stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not being extreme here. Like, all I'm trying to say is there's a difference between necessary and there's a difference between unnecessary. And you got people who are, you know, going to Africa and hunting lions for the sake of hunting lions. They'll just go and shoot a lion just to kill it and take a picture as if, like, it boosts their ego or something. Is that really necessary? No, it's not. Like, in that sense, honor God's creation. Just look at what's necessary and what's unnecessary. And these are all things you guys know. Buy less, give more. Let's not be a consumeristic society. Let's not go through and, and have our possessions define ourselves. Let's not go through and say, I'm going to try to accumulate as much. I mean, wealth, wealth is fine, but I'm not trying to accumulate as many possessions and think that I own something. That, that what is on the earth and everything is not that what God gave me. Like, don't we always say we offer unto you what is yours? And sometimes we forget that. So we forget God is our ruler. Um, Recycle when possible. Like if it's an option, if it's there, if you if you have a recycle bin, just recycle. Like little things here and there. Don't litter. Like we know those things. Finish your plate. This was interesting. The average American household throws away 640 pounds of food per year. The average household throws 640 pounds. So I mean, I don't know exactly how many households there are in America, but I would you know venture to say. It's probably about 100 billion pounds, maybe even a little bit more of, of food that's being wasted in America alone. So, I mean, there's little things like that. And then conserve energy. We, we don't want to keep the lights on anyway. We don't want to keep the cars running. We turn them off when we can. Um, and just reduce consumption. So things like that. Not trying to be extreme. I, I know that this is a touchy subject. But if we forget, you know, like the, the effect, we worry about kind of the process and forget about the, the outcome worry about the process and think about, you know, maybe I should start giving a little bit more than consuming and maybe producing a little bit more than, than I think having that paradigm shift in culture is going to be beneficial to us and it'll be beneficial to, to uh, the environment and resources. Environmental misconceptions. People say the earth is going to burn up and pass away. And, you know, we read, like, do not love the world nor things which are in the world. The word's going to pass away. We read heaven will pass away. Earth will pass away. My words will by no means pass away. The people think the world is going to burn up. 
so there's fire in the Bible, and fire is often used as purification, right? And, and St. Peter says the heavens are going to disappear in an uproar, and the earth is going to be laid bare by fire. Fire will lay bare the earth. Honestly, we know with a coming in contact is not with God does not destroy you. Like it doesn't, it, God's not going to burn us. It doesn't destroy you. Fire is used as purification. It's a transformation. So it's, we talk about, you know, Christ saying, behold, I make all things new. And we talk about, I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. It's a transformation. I don't know exactly what that looks like. Uh, there's smarter people but than me <laughs> in this room, but we're looking at a transformation, not something that's just, God is going to come and destroy. There is the world, there's creation, there's man. We're, we are transformed. We are, we are old and we get transformed to new. And, and the same would apply with creation. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but creation is transformed. All of creation is transformed. And that's from, from the old to the new. Uh, God gave us the earth to use, so we shouldn't worry. Yet yeah, he did give us the earth to use as a priestly duty, as, as a priestly responsibility. He gave it to us to care for it. And the role of a priest, I mean, you guys know, especially in the Old Testament, was a big deal. Like they had, a, they, they guarded, they protected. Um, so we, we are all priests in that sense in, in caring for God's creation. We should use it and use resources, but we shouldn't abuse it. We shouldn't abuse, you know, the environment and the resources. Um, people are vastly more important than nature. 100% true, but God loves all of his creation. We are definitely the pride and joy. We're the prize possession, but God loves all of his creation. And then my efforts won't make a difference. No, effort, all efforts make a difference. Um, you know, it, if we get that, that shift from, from, you know, contributing as humans to rather just consuming and, and forgetting about how much am I going to put in my house and all the, the junk here and there, if we, if we start thinking about, well, how are we just going to give back a little bit? I think, honestly, the environment as collateral damage is going to be something that's going to be gone away with. Like, it's going to be an afterthought. We're not even going to really be thinking about it if we get that shift. Um, and I think that is it, actually. So let's stand up for a prayer. name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you, Lord. I ask that you please transform our, our minds and our hearts, Lord, and that really shift away from, from consuming and really contributing, Lord, and really focus on you as our creator, and that we never strip the word Lord from you, that you are our ruler, you are our, our, our master, you are our king, and that everything belongs to you. We don't define ourselves with our possessions, but we define ourselves with our identity in Christ. And I ask that you bless us, you bless this church, Lord, and, and you give us a, a renewed thinking in terms of, of what is necessary and what is unnecessary. I ask this for the intercessions of St. Mary, St. Timothy, and St. Athanasius, as we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come.